So I think working with those guidelines on keeping the fish, you know, submerged in the water, like dipping the fish back in the water before you take a shot. I think getting creative and being able to photograph the fish in its natural element, that's going to elevate your photos and it shows people that you're conservation minded. And I think photography and fish photography is great. It's awesome. The grip and grin can be fun as well, but those photos that are really going to kind of spark interest and make an impact, there's a level of respect between the angler and the fish. Welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast, inspiring real women with a passion for fishing in the outdoors to go get their adventure on. Now, here's your host, Master Captain Angie Scott. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast. I've been doing a lot of video episodes lately, so I want you guys to know you can also now catch these via video on YouTube, the Woman Angler and Adventure YouTube channel. Uh, it's youtube.com slash channel slash the Woman Angler. I think it's fun to be able to see the guests in person. So whenever possible, definitely going to be doing doing video episodes as well as the uh, regular audio versions that you can get on all the major podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, um, you name it, iHeartRadio, Pandora, we're there. So appreciate you guys uh, listening week after week. I've got a very special guest this week, Mac Elliott, who is one of only two female photographers in the fishing industry that I'm aware of. And there may be more, but um, she's really amazing and does some awesome work. So uh, you'll definitely want to check that out. And I'm going to be welcoming Mac on in just a second. But before we do, I just wanted to show you guys something kind of cool. Um, I met these guys down at ICAST this past year. Uh, they're called Cell Helmet. They've been on Shark Tank, so you may have seen them. But they make these Fortitude cell phone cases that you can actually customize with your own images. So whatever you want to put on here, you can upload a photo. They'll create your own customized cell phone case. So of course, this is the Woman Angler and Adventure logo with the cool ocean scene in the background. There's also a pink one. Um, these are for the iPhone 11. And I'm going to be doing a giveaway if you have an iPhone 11 and you want one of these cases, you can pick whichever color you like, and it's going to be done via the King Sumo platform. So if you go to the show notes for this episode, just click on that King Sumo link, enter to win. It's super easy. All you got to do is put in your email address, and uh, there's multiple ways to earn more entries as well. Um, here's just a couple other examples. This was a uh, fun from our fishing trip. Uh, it's upside down. This is fun from our trip we did on Lake Erie, where we uh, went with Brittany Howard and we were casting for walleyes. And that was actually filmed for the Midwest Outdoors TV show. And the uh, first segment's going to be coming out in March. So we're excited about that. And then the second segment is coming out in April. And you, if you don't live in the Midwest, uh, you can get it on the Pursuit channel. And I believe it's going to be up on YouTube as well. So be on the lookout for that too. But uh, just real quick on these cases, they're uh, very, very strong uh, patent pe pending technology. Um, some texture on the outside to give you a really good grip uh, on your phone. Uh, buttons right where you need those buttons to be. And then, of course, all the ports that you need for your particular device in if you don't have an iPhone or iPhone 11, they have cases to fit any device. So just go to the website. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And there's also a code that you'll be able to use to save some money on these too. So um, a couple other things with the technology, there's this diamond cut around the outside that gives it uh, some extra strength. They call it pyramid protect. And then one of my favorite features is this uh, 
don't know if you can see, it's a textured background here called Cross Diffuse. And what that does is it helps to keep your device cool as uh, you know, we're, we're on our devices a lot these days. And especially if you're out in the field, they can get very hot uh, just from using them and, and the batteries heating up and whatnot. And so having this cooling technology built in helps a lot. So uh, really, really nice cases for us outdoor adventurers. So go check out Cell Helmet, Cell Helmet. use the link in the show notes below. And without further ado, let's get into our conversation with Mac Elliott. Mac Elliott, welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer podcast. I'm so excited to have you on this week. Thank you for having me. This is my second official podcast recording. Oh, nice. So I'm an old I'm an old <laughs> pro by now. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Great. Was it a video or just audio? Um, it was video and okay. we set up some camp chairs outside in like 40 degree weather. So oh, nice. I was shaking quite a bit. <laughs> it was so yeah, cool. I can't imagine. Yeah. My uh, my ultimate goal, I have a truck camper and my dream is to be able to just travel around with the camper and do on-site interviews with people. But the nice thing yeah. about that is if it's cold, we can just go inside the camper. <laughs> yeah, that's so, a good call. Yeah. yeah. Well, very cool. Well, we just met recently at the Academy Sports and Outdoors Women's Retreat, and you were our photographer. So I wanted to to talk a little bit about that event. Um, this wasn't your your first rodeo, as far as film or uh, you know doing photography for a fishing event. But just I uh, wanted to get your kind of takeaways from the time we had together. What do you think about all of it? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I've never been in such a big group of women that were all like outdoor minded, um, not necessarily in the like fishing space, but people who were like really passionate about trying new things. Some people were like pros at fishing. Other people hadn't ever held a fish before. And I think that was so beautiful. And I think it's really important to be able to see that in the outdoor industry, like knowing you don't have to be a professional fisherman, fisherwoman to enjoy the sport um, and really like get like dive deep into the culture of the fishing and outdoor lifestyle. So I thought it was a really good opportunity to like bring people in, make the space a little more inclusive. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, I loved that. There's something powerful, I think, when you get a group of women together that are like minded and, uh, you know, doing something as fun as as that uh, retreat was. I mean, we had yeah, just great, great experiences all around. Great food. <laughs> oh, my um, gosh. Great, great um, fishing guides that took us out. And I think it was really cool to see. So. Um, they paired us up with different ladies in the boats each day that we got to go out. And I got to be with some of the ladies who had never really fished before or maybe tried it when they were younger, but hadn't fished ever since. And they all did really, really good. I yeah. was just really impressed. You know, I thought, I thought, oh, they're not, you know, they're not going to be able to make good casts or, um, you know, better watch out. You know, I don't want to get hit by any hooks or anything like that in the boat, but yeah, everyone did really well, at least with who I was with. So, right. Was yeah. And I think you, you give people the opportunity to be vulnerable in a sense and try new things like fishing can look really intimidating, especially fly fishing, which is what I work in most often. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there's power in showing anyone can do it. Anyone can try this out. Um, and giving people that opportunity because it's not a cheap sport or hobby by any means, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think that it would be a beautiful thing to give people the opportunity in a judgment-free zone 
to try their hand at fishing because even I need that and I work most of the, like part-time most of the time in the fishing industry. Yeah. And that was probably one of the best spaces for that because Mm -hmm. all these ladies were so supportive and excited for the ones that don't get to fish as often or, or had no experience at all, just to, you know, see them get their first fish. I think everybody caught fish, which is also awesome. And uh, and not be judged. Uh, I know like day two for us was a little slower. We were hoping to go off, off shore a little bit and experience mm-hmm. some of that. And it was just too rough out there to go out. So we kind of had to do plan B and um, stay inshore in a bay boat. And um, we tried to uh, get some big bull reds is what we were doing. So we, we just had some bait out and basically we were just waiting for the rods to start popping off with huge fish. And the plan was, um, I was probably the most experienced angler in the boat. So if we did get one, the plan was to let one of the other ladies take the rod first. And then if we got another one, then the other lady would go and then me, you know, so we would all have an opportunity. Unfortunately, we didn't get anything that day I mean we caught some smaller fish but not those big bull reds that we were hoping for which would have been really cool right but I always say it just takes one fish like whether you're doing like just fishing for the fun of it or you're doing a photo shoot or anything I'm like we just need the one fish (laughs) we have the one fish we know that we're blessed (laughs) yeah which I mean you're not even promised that one fish right no that's why they call it fishing and not catching (laughs) not catching (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, I would have I would have sat there all day just for the chance that we could have got one of those big bull reds because I yeah. know that that would have been an amazing experience. But I don't blame our camp captain for you know after we sat there for a while we we tried a couple different spots you know but he kind of threw in the towel and was like all right let's just go catch whatever we can get and we got some some uh, speckled trout which is always fun so Heck yeah yeah. So, all right. So I want to get into, well, I did want to ask you too, like, what did you think of the Magellan gear that we got to try out? Yeah, I was really impressed. I feel like when I think of Magellan, I think of like my dad's fishing closet from the nineties <laughs> and I got there and like the prints were so fun and it's like really technical gear at like an amazing price point. And I think when we compare it to other brands in the outdoor industry, it's very refreshing, like seeing a piece of technical outdoor gear that's, you know, protective for your skin. Like it works for the sport that you're uh, doing um, at a like lower, like more moderate price point. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important to have. Very yeah. important. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, fishing is not a cheap sport. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so it's, it's great to have access to really good quality gear that, that actually does what it's supposed to do when you're out there. Um, whether it's keeping you warm, like I got this nice fleece on with the built-in neck gator that definitely oh, yeah. came in handy <laughs> when we were in Jacksonville, cause it was a little chilly out there. Um, yeah. And uh, just, you know, all the attention to detail that they've put into the design and and to be at such a lower price point is yeah. uh, really, really cool to see. So, yeah. And I think a lot of the pieces are they have a, a little bit of a feminine side to them, which I appreciate because mm-hmm. um, I like to say, you know, I'll go fishing on a boat with a bunch of guys but I'm wearing my like pink shirt and my lipstick and my like dangly earrings. So I think just being able to like dress it up and have a good time and be like, yeah, I'm working in the fishing industry, but I can look feminine as well. Like that's super fun. Yeah. Well, cool. I do want to get into some of your background and like how you got into it. Um, I, I read, I found a, an uh, interview that you'd done on, um, what was it? Uh, it's on your website. Um, nomadic. Nomadic. Yeah. 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 That's it. 
it was a really, really well done interview, but I really enjoyed reading your story. And I think how you got into it is super inspiring because um, I think a lot of people find themselves in similar situations and Mm -hmm. are maybe too afraid to make the leap like you did. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I feel like in a lot of ways, at least in the fly fishing industry, my journey has been really fast and speedy, but um, it took me, you know, at least 12 years to like build up to the point that I am at now. But my first exposure to commercial photography and media production was during college, I was not happy where I was at. I was going to a really amazing school, um, but I felt like the experience was kind of, um, it was kind of wasted on me a little bit because I wasn't fulfilled with where I was. I thought that I should be doing more. I got an, like an opportunity out of the blue to travel the world, take photos and videos and kind of work for myself and like direct an entire marketing campaign for a gap year program. So I dropped out of school. My like advisor, I was in the honors college. My honors college advisor told me this is the biggest mistake of your life. You'll never recover from this. You should not drop out. And I just looked at her and I said, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, but Like, I think this is going to make my life Mm -hmm. like no one gets that opportunity. Yeah. So I dropped out of college. It's my favorite thing to tell people. (laughs) And I traveled the world for a year, went to so many countries like Southeast Asia, New Zealand, Nepal, Tibet, South America, Central America, and just, you know, sink or swim in the commercial media industry, learned the hard way, most things. And it changed my life. Yeah, I would not be working the career that I am in today without that experience. And I'm so grateful for it. That's amazing. I I did eventually finish my degree. Okay. Has anyone asked to see my degree? Not at all. But (laughs) great. I know. Yeah, Yeah, that's kind of a little bit messed up in our society today yeah. too, but yeah. Um, so what, talk a little bit about what is a gap year program? Cause watching your video, yeah. that was actually the first time I'd ever heard of something like that. Right. And in a lot of ways, I mean, I took a gap year it reflects on my experience, but it's often the year between high school and college where you take some time off If you're burnt out from high school, a lot of the people went to private high schools, so the curriculum was really intense, or they're not quite sure what direction they want to move with their adult career or what they want to study or major in. So they would take a year between college in high school to travel and kind of get real world experience. Um. Yeah, and that, in a lot of ways, my experience was a gap year, and it made it so that when I went back to school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life, and I'm doing it now, and I didn't actually think that you can make a career out of photography or video production or just going fishing. (laughs) It's so bizarre to me. (laughs) It's awesome. I think think the gap year should be a requirement for everybody. Right. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how many more people, if they did that and had that experience, would kind of find their path faster than the way that we traditionally do it. You know, a lot of people get into a career and find out they're absolutely miserable. And some some people just stay with it just because. And some people, you know, go, you know, through schooling or whatever you have to do to make that shift to something else and right. uh, how how much easier it would be if we just knew, knew what we were supposed to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I started studying journalism in college and then I realized I hate reading the newspaper. Like I probably shouldn't be studying journalism. <laughs> <laughs> so it all worked out. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so, so fishing photography 
um, you're you and Jessica Hadel are the only two female that I'm aware of in the fishing industry that that do this. Um, so obviously, fishing you you must have had some background in that growing up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my parents like to say they went wade fishing and pulled my twin brother and I uh, behind them in like a little raft. (laughs) So (laughs) I've always been immersed in the fishing culture, grew up fishing. And it wasn't until like high school and college that I was moving away from that, that culture, I guess I like to call it, and was finding my own things in life that gave me joy. I moved out of Texas for a while. And when I traveled, I was out of the States. So I had nothing to do with fishing for like four or five years before I actually started the fly fishing photography. And and in a lot of ways, I think it was COVID that pushed me to rediscover Texas and fishing and recreation in Texas because you know, I couldn't just up and go somewhere on the other side of the world. So. Right. Yeah. Blessing in disguise. Yeah. I think it was for a lot of people for sure. Yeah. Um, Well, you have some absolutely stunning photos of fish uh, on your, on your, in your portfolio. And uh, what, what kind of draws you to some of those shots that you take? Yeah. You know, I started it because I went on a fishing trip with my family and I was getting kind of bored of just casting and I would catch fish, but the adrenaline wasn't there for me. And I think you can, you can't really fake passion in that way. And so I would get as close to the water as I could while other people were fishing and just rapid fire shots at these fish, like fighting on the fly. and discovered like I can get pretty close to getting pinpoint focus on these moving fish like that's really random and I don't know how that happened but it (laughs) gave me this adrenaline rush it was just bizarre so it wasn't until like six months later that one of those photos got picked up to be published in a magazine and that was the first moment I was like oh I could make money off of this like (laughs) That, like people want to see this that's crazy I had no idea there was even an industry for it before 2020 mm. yeah that's very cool love it um scrolling through my notes here so one of the quotes I saw I think in the interview that I read you said luck is where preparation meets opportunity and that's like one of your models oh yeah Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, I do think that luck is a real thing. Um, I think we're very fortunate to work in this industry. I think you have to work hard to, to get where you're at. But another thing I like to say is overnight success, 12 years in the making, (laughs) because a lot of the times I think it looks like that on my Instagram where people are like, where did this girl come from? Like, she's taking these pictures of fish like they're cool um and I've been working on it in some way for the past 12 years and all of my life experiences culminated to give me the opportunity to capture fish in action and I'm not sure that I would have ever guessed that that's where my career had been heading but it makes sense now. And yeah, I think a lot of it's luck, but that luck is where preparation meets opportunity. <laughs> you definitely have it. to be on the, the lookout for opportunity as well. And yeah. just say yes. Yeah. Just be, be available. Um, don't, you know, shut anything down mm-hmm. without, yeah. I mean, obviously you got to say no to some things, but mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And I think you get to a place in your career where you can be a little more picky with what you're producing and who you're working with. But for the first year and I'm like fresh, I'm like 
just over a year into fishing photography. For the first year, I was working for very little money and like to treat a no pay job or like a $40 job the same as a $4,000 job. And I think that sets up a really good, really good practice um, for anybody who's trying to break into an industry. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. So for those listening or watching this, this uh, episode, um, probably a lot of people that are watching, they're not out to be a professional photographer in fishing, but a lot of us that like to fish or do outdoor adventures do like to document our experiences. And of course, you know, social media, uh, making good like Instagram posts and things like that. Do you have any kind of basic level tips that you could share for just the average hobbyist? Yeah. So one thing that I like to think about when I'm taking pictures of my friends fishing, my family fishing, or even clients is how to take the classic grip and grin to the next level. And there's an account called keep fish wet and it's a movement to promote sustainable angling habits, mostly I think in fly fishing, but I think it can be applied across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, but they have tips on how to take images that are as low impact to these fish as possible. So I think working with those guidelines on keeping the fish, you know, submerged in the water, like dipping the fish back in the water before you take a shot, I think getting creative and being able to photograph the fish in its natural element that's going to elevate your photos and it shows people that you're conservation minded. And I think photography and fish photography is great. It's awesome. The gripping grin can be fun as well, but those photos that are really going to kind of spark interest and make an impact, there's a level of respect between the angler and the fish. Mm. And that's, like one of my favorite tips to follow and give. Yeah. That's, that's great. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. So I come from the mostly here, probably the last six years or so I've been really getting into bass fishing in last year, I actually fished competitively on the women's pro bass tour and in bass fishing um, with all the years that it's been on television and stuff, I, I've seen it. We've really come a long ways as far as starting to care about the fish because typically we're catching and releasing, but how you treat that fish in between the time that you catch it and you release it makes a big difference as to mm-hmm. you know how that fish is going to respond, um, if they're going to survive or not. And um, a lot of these old fishing shows you'd watch, the guys would would catch these bass and they'd hold them up, you know, long ways. And then they'd even be jack jawed, um, which is where, you know, you kind of turn the fish. And then we've learned now that you're actually like breaking that fish's jaw when you do that. And then they'll be unable to eat. And so now it's, you know, we're starting to see less of those pictures or videos and more of holding the fish horizontally, you know, supporting it, which is good, good to see. Um, yeah, but I like to I, treat the fish like a baby. Like, how would you yeah. hold a baby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I remember watching old TV shows where, um, you know, they'd catch a bass and they'd be holding it out of the water and talking about, okay, I use this technique and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, put the fish back in the water. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like, I think. Um, we are getting better, but <laughs> oh, absolutely. In Florida, we were keeping a few reds, and I, you know, I grew up eating redfish. I love redfish, but my uh, captain of the media boat, Fred, he, we caught a redfish together. I was reeling it in, gave it to Fred, and he was like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "I need to take pictures of this. I'm not reeling <laughs> in this fish." But we got it. It was a beautiful red. We could definitely keep it. And he's like, "Do you want to keep it?" And I said no, like redfish are my buddies. Let's let them go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So whenever I can catch and release and there's something so special about capturing the release as well. 
Yeah, I feel yeah, like you should fun. have like cinematic music in the background, just letting <laughs> it go. Yeah, love it. Yeah, redfish are such a beautiful fish too. Mm-hmm. So, and you definitely have a lot of amazing redfish photos. So, I'm gonna share your uh, your website so everybody can go check out your portfolio and some of the other things that you do. MacElliottMedia.com. And then yep. follow you on Instagram at Mac Elliott Media. And I'll put links to that in the show notes for this episode. Um, do you have anything coming up that you want to talk about or share? So at the end of March, I'll be at the Houston Fishing Show. I'll have a booth selling redfish prints. I love doing metal prints and uh, I do really fun big redfish art because I think every wall needs a good redfish tail on it. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. agree. That, that's awesome. Uh-huh. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, great conversation. I learned a lot and uh, it's just been a pleasure getting to know you and I wish you all the best of luck in your fishing adventures. Oh my gosh, Angie. Thank you. And uh, don't be a stranger. Absolutely. Absolutely.